And now I will resume. So 300 years ago, uh, we talked a little bit about what you'd be eating and how you'd be surviving, just a little bit, just a taste of that. Uh, we've talked a little bit about what your language would be like. What would your village life be like? Well, first of all, you would live in a village almost assuredly. Um, as I said before, salmon really changed everything, um, moving people into these more permanent villages to make use of that resource. And if we look at a specific site called Slycock Creek Village, which was um, a site that existed actually where my college is, King Nizzo College, but predates the college. It was abandoned, we think around 1600. So it wasn't like the college displaced this community, but there was this Dominion village there um, a few hundred years ago that we've done some research on. And you can kind of see a really clear pattern of what a lot of Dinaina villages might have looked like. And that matches a lot of the other Dinaina sites we found. Basically this site we have um, like six house pits or Nichil, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then um, I think for like between 70 to 90 um, cash pits. And I don't think anyone's counted them all. We've counted as many as we could. Um, so the cash pits, let's talk about those. One of the things that allowed Dinaina communities to thrive were these um, cash pits, as we call them in English, or then uh, the U becomes a O oh, sound book when it's bordered by a GH, a glottal, so a back wheeler, sorry, um, in Dinaina. But these would have been about mm, like the six to 12 um, feet long. And then they would have been like, mm, like three to six feet deep. I, yeah, basically three to six feet deep. And what they are is you have like these logs on the top that protect this from like bears or from if someone's raiding your village from another culture. But then underneath that, what you have is um, a pit and the pit is lined with um, birch bark, which keeps things relatively dry and which is found in abundance in the Cook Inlet area. And then also inside of those layers of birch bark, this is like genius. Just listen to this. There was sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss is a very fascinating moss. If you're not into moss, you should be at least into this moss. But among other things, it has an antimicrobial property to it. So it would have helped the salmon not to rot because what's inside this big container is layers and layers and layers of dried fish separated by grass. So what you basically have is a deep freeze, right? Like many of us have in our garage, before there's electricity. Genius. Um, and as a result, people were able to make use of like the late run silver salmon and store them away for the winter and in general cut up their salmon so that they have food all winter. They'd still go hunt and things like that, but they had this kind of like core supply of salmon that they could fall back on and that they would divvy out during the um, winter. And so this helped like encourage the growth of these villages now that you have this stable like semi year round source of food. So it allowed people to preserve them through the winter, make use of um, kings and later in silvers, and really thrive during a little ice age, when in some ways you could say that things got tougher, um, but this was able to use that to their advantage, right? The soil is a little colder during this time period, and you're able to do these cash pits. By the way, you might say, well, if that's so genius, why wasn't that done in more places? Um, there's kind of similar pits in other areas, but this specific kind, no, with this very specific type of construction. Um, as far as we know, as a Dinaina things so like why not way up here, way down here? And the answer is straightforward, but fascinating. You go too far north and there's too much permafrost and you can't dig into the ground without significant effort. You go too far south and the soil doesn't get cold enough to be a good freezing instrument for your fish. Your sweet spot is basically the Kenai Peninsula slash like kind of Cook Inlet, Iliamna, this kind of area, basically Dinaina country. Um, so there's this like close symbiotic relationship between Dinaina society and cash pits. There's also, if you go to a Dinaina site, these nichif, um, the L that you see there is what we call barred L. It's a hard letter for English speakers to get used to usually. It's like an L that you breathe through, that you hold in and breathe through. But these were usually spaced out. These were usually high above the river. Um, you might pause the video and think why. And the answer is we don't know. Um, I mean, the Hyba River has some advantages. And sometimes they are right by the river, like a village that I was helping um, excavate recently um, out in sort of Cooper Landing, more like closer to um, 
like the Kenai Wildlife Refuge, like in the middle of the Kenai Wildlife Refuge. But there are sites that are right by rivers, but then there are also sometimes sites that are like up on a bluff. That's kind of interesting. More interesting is the houses are often spaced out. But in any case, these houses um, are really large. They're often like 10 by 20 kind of houses or even bigger. And they oftentimes have these like side chambers. And so what we have nowadays, we don't still have these houses, like right? These logs have decayed. And this is not the kind of home that Denina people live in anymore. And it's not the kind of home that Denina people have lived in, generally speaking, for a hundred years, right? Denina people in our communities live in homes, obviously, just that look like anybody else's homes. Generally speaking, I hope that is like, clear and obvious to say, uh, if you're not from these communities. But yeah, people are living in, you know, same kind of houses. But 300 years ago, 400 years ago, um, just like houses everywhere looked very different, Denina houses looked very different. And they were these large structures with birch bark as the shingles, as the roofing, with a certain kind of grass on the sides that insulated well, with these large entrances that were kind of low level entrances. Those entrances, by the way, would oftentimes have like a bear skin or other animal fur on the front. So you could like open or close it and thus manipulate the flow of like heat and fire and smoke because sometimes, which for a variety of reasons, including that some of these houses appear to have been used to smoke fish. So your, it was your home, but it was also sometimes your smokehouse. Um, you'd have these two benches and in the benches, there'd be compartments like you could open up this door and then like that's where mom and dad would typically sleep. And oftentimes that's also where like the daughters of the home would sleep and then the sons would sleep on top of here, usually with like probably with like furs underneath them and stuff so they're not getting cold. Speaking of not getting cold, you've got a fire in the middle, the wood would be brought by the young boys, you got a fire in the middle, it's on like this kind of, I always think of it as looking like a crib, but anyways, a, like a, a fire holder um, of logs and then sand in the middle. The sand is another one of our many genius adaptations here because the sand acts as a heat sink. Your fire burns down for the night, sand continues to radiate the heat throughout the night so that you still got some warmth. Um, it's got a hole at the top. They often, they usually also have side chambers. And from what we can tell, those side chambers probably had a variety of purposes, uh, including that that would be a place where women could stay with their baby after they had just had a baby to have some privacy and comfort. It's also a place that elders would often stay, like grandma and grandpa, if they're living in the home as well. It's a smaller space, easier to heat. So you would put like heated rocks in there and grandma and grandpa had like a little compartment that they could stay extra warm in while they're sleeping. Um, so incredible, beautiful houses. And today the houses are gone, but what remains are the depressions. And you can't see it very well in this picture, um, but basically large rectangular depressions, one or two feet deep into the ground with a very peculiar rectangular shape with side chambers. And you're like, oh, I denied a house was here hundreds of years ago. Just like with the cash pits, you find these large like 10 by 10 circles and you're like, oh, a Denina cash pit is here. <laughs> Underneath us is probably a bunch of salmon bones or perhaps no salmon bones and just the birch bark because people ate the salmon. Now, what would your, that's a little bit about what your life would look like in terms of what the village would look like. You'd probably have, you know, five to 10 houses, um, each of them with a fairly large family group in them. So, you know, maybe 100 to 200 people, um, maybe a little smaller. What would your social life have looked like among those people? Well, in a village or in a calle, as you would say in Denaina, um, you have a system of what we call, huh, I don't know how that didn't work well. I don't know why that, sorry, that got deleted. Um, you'd have a system where you have the geshka or the chief or wealthy person. Basically, um, what the Russians called toyans, um, they would be like the parent of the village in the sense that they were there to make sure everyone had their needs taken care of. If somebody's, for example, um, husband was off and in a long-term hunting party, they made sure that that family still had the wood that they needed for their fires. And then if and each if people needed food during the winter that they weren't getting from hunting or something, they would go to the cash pits and take out a certain amount of salmon and like divvy it, divvy it out to everybody to make sure everybody had something to eat. Um, so that was the idea of the Geshka. They were really there to make sure everyone was taken care of. If there was orphans and there wasn't like close family that the orphans could be adopted by, 
oftentimes the Jeshka would be the ones that would adopt orphan um, children into their home. And so they were important leaders, but they were helped by this group, by everybody else who would be referred to as Nakivka, which basically means our clan helpers, which tells you something, which is that often, not always, but very often, um, the other people that weren't the chief would be people that were related to the chief by clan relationships. So this is a kind of a kinship-based kind of village. And everybody would work together, pool their resources to get us to get the salmon and put them up together and oftentimes share. Um, from the, the salmon caches and oftentimes um, share their hunts and things like that. It was a very, it was a quite collectivist and cultural orientation in that way of uh, people sharing resources with each other. Um, there were sometimes war captives um, from, if like, for example, if another group had raided you and then you went and raided them and like took some of the people back. And then there's like indication that oftentimes like after a short period, those people would then be released after like a couple of years. Um, the historical record on this is really scarce. And so I hesitate to say more because I feel like that could present these communities in a really perhaps light that's not sort of in line with our modern um, views on um, well, slavery, right? Um, but the problem with that is we have so little data that I really hesitate to draw that conclusion. So I guess I bring it up probably because you'll sometimes hear people talk about that uh, like in a museum or something, but I would kind of push back a little bit and say like, we don't know a lot and what we do know is from sources that you really have to take with a big grain of salt um so you could really just cross that out because we really don't know much about that in fact i will cross that out and just say that what we know for sure though is that there was keshka and that there's nakilka there was chiefs and then there was the people that were working with the chiefs to make sure everyone was provided for um and so you had people related by villages that lived in the same area, and then you had people related by clans, and more broadly, what are called a moiety. A moiety is basically like you would have your specific clan. Your clan would be like people you were kind of distantly related to in your village and also in other villages. And let's say, for example, your fishtail clan. And then you'd also have like a moiety, which is kind of like a mega clan, or like a group of several clans, or like a, you have several groups in the southern part of Alaska have this, where the whole society is divided into two halves. Like half of the clans on this side, half of the clans on the other side. So you would have had a specific clan and a specific moiety. Um, and when you introduced yourself, you may have introduced yourself by a clan that would have been a really important part of your identity as a way that you thought of yourself as a person. And it's interesting that to this day, um, some if you do a traditional greeting in Denaina, where you like introduce yourself, oftentimes um, if people are choosing to introduce themselves in Denaina language, sometimes they'll choose to like go through, this is the village I'm from, this is the family I'm from. And occasionally you'll hear like something about clans, though more often just like family and village. So that continues to be an important part of how people identify themselves, which is a good example of sort of these traditional practices, these practices that go back to pre-colonial times have obviously changed, but in some ways the spirit of them, the kind of basic idea of them, of like you identify yourselves by families, still very much continues to this day for a lot of people. Um, so the clans, by the way, would be exogenous, which basically means you would have had to marry someone outside of your clan, which typically would have means met somebody outside of your village. Um, by 1930s, clans were starting to be di more difficult for people to remember who belonged to which clan. Um, but again, the idea of kinship was certainly still there. And even several decades later in places like Lyme Village in Ileana, you still had them working to some degree. Um, we already talked about Moi Moiti. Um, historically, we, as far as we can tell, most Geshka or chiefs were male, um, although I, one source suggests that they could also be women, and I've not had confirmation of that, but I point that out as something interesting um, and worth pointing out. Um, both groups had some version, both men and women had some version of a coming of age ceremony, by the way. Um, you might also ask sort of, okay, so that's what my village would have looked like, that's what my village would have been structured like. What would my actual daily life have been like? Um, among other things, uh, people were expected to rise early. Their rising with the sun was a very good thing. Boys would often be bringing in wood and water. Um, one source suggests that people would eat just one time a day unless they were, but then they give a bunch of caveats, like except for old people, except for kids. So I guess some people only ate one time a day, like during dinner. Um, and then it, it would appear that in some villages you would eat all together, and in some, you would eat like to 
um, by your specific household. And then and in the evening, after you were kind of done with work and with eating, uh, people like in our area, Kina and Sultana, would head down to the beach. There would have been other places in other villages. But among other things, there was all sorts of different games that people would play with each other. And then also, especially storytelling, especially in the winter, where like in the winter, if you could tell different story each day during the winter, like you were considered awesome at storytelling. Um, so people were not just sort of eating, right? Surviving, making a house. Um, people had spare time, people had leisure time. Uh, I would argue that probably some people had more leisure time than some of our 80 hour work weeks that we're used to nowadays. And people had all sorts of ways that they filled up that leisure time. Um, people also are sometimes curious, okay, well, if I lived 300 years ago, like what about war and stuff like that? Um, the answer is there was little, if very little, if any war in the way that we might think of war nowadays where a country tries to take the territory of another country or entirely control another country. Instead, what you sometimes had was um, intermittent low-level raiding warfare, where like one group would raid another group and then that group would raid them in retaliation. And their various stories suggest that sometimes happened with Yupik and Alutik communities, um, that there would have been raiding back and forth but they would have been fairly minor and not have been like a long lasting thing and not have resulted in like a big change in who has what territory. The goal was not to like take land. Um, it was more about raiding um, and sometimes retaliation. I will pause there.